Good afternoon, and thank you for joining our COVID-19 vaccination and flu speaker series. Uh, we have three timely topics and three knowledgeable and engaging panelists. I'm looking forward to the next 90 minutes. We're taking time this afternoon to provide data and an evidence-based perspective for you and your enterprises so you can be safe, healthy, uh, and productive. For those of you who have not met, I'm Keith Forrester, uh, Vice President of Marketing, Sales, and Business Devele Development uh, at Kaiser Permanente. Um, before I introduce our panel, there's just two housekeeping items. Uh, one is that this uh, webinar will be recorded so that we continually improve uh, the way that we bring uh, messages and information uh, to the market. So um, what did you know that? The other is that while cameras are turned off and phones are muted to focus our attention, uh, you can submit questions and we encourage you to do that via, via the Q&A function. Um, we'll weave these into our conversation and we receive several ahead of time. And so we'll plan to weave those in, but we'll take more as they come along. We'll have time uh, at the end of our prepared remarks to have those uh, questions addressed as well. So let me turn to our uh, panelists and introduce them. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, Jennifer Stacy. So it's my privilege to work with Jennifer. She's the Director of Strategic Accounts and Dental. And so what that means is she oversees our dental line of business, line of business from sales and account management perspective. And then her and her team uh, work with our largest customers. So welcome her. We're also joined by Dr. Bachman and Dr. DeConis. Dr. Bachman is a primary care internist practicing at Portland uh, since 1998. In addition to his clinical work, he serves as a Permanente Quality Ambassador, connecting the needs of our group customers to Kaiser Permanente Care Delivery. Uh, he's also the medical director of the Kaiser Permanente Northwest Workforce Health Team, and that's a team that works with some of our largest employers about how to keep their workforce as healthy and as productive uh, and as engaged as possible. Dr. Conis is the CEO of Northwest Permanente, and that means that she leads more than 1,700 physicians, clinicians, and administrators at Permanente Medicine. She's a passionate advocate for addressing the social and environmental determinants of health and is working to transform the culture, practice, and business of medicine uh, at Northwest Permanente, as well as the entire Northwest and, and even wider. Many of you may not know that Northwest Permanente, which is actually a separate entity than uh, Kaiser Permanente Northwest Hospitals, which is where Jennifer and I work, not to get too much in the weeds, but they're an independent organization that we have uh, a mutual uh, exclusive relationship with around practicing medicine and providing care for you and for your employees. Um, you may not know that Northwest Permanente is a B corporation, and I encourage you to look into that. And with that, they were honored in three categories in 2019. Um, they were noticed, uh, recognized for the best for the world overall, uh, best for customers, and best for workers certified, uh, again, by the B Lab. And Dr. DeConis was instrumental uh, in that B Corp status and designation. So I appreciate her work. In, uh, in advocating and bringing about more sustainability in all that we do. Uh, so with that, it's just an introduction to our panelists. I'll turn this over uh, to Dr. Bachman to go through um, our agenda. Great, thank you very much, Keith. Um, we'll be talking about three things today. We'll be updating you with uh, information about uh, COVID, uh, where things are standing now, both in our care delivery system and in the broader um, world of COVID. Second thing we'll be talking about is influenza and what we're thinking, what we think will happen this flu season when the pandemic of COVID hits the seasonal uh, influenza season. Uh, and Dr. DeConos will be talking about that second topic. And the third topic will be how do we support employees and family through this pandemic? We've really seen the marked social stress that uh, COVID is uh, um, playing on our society uh, with lots of concerns about uh, job security, financial security, education of children, uh, and all that will, will affect employees uh, in our approaches to keeping people healthy. So that's what the next 90 minutes looks like. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bachman. So to get us started, would you uh, give us the latest on COVID-19 testing and vaccinations? This would be a great place to start. Great. Well, I uh, last night after the debate, I decided to liven things up and look at the uh, 
Um, <laughs> look at the epidemiology of COVID to cheer me up, but I, I wasn't too successful at that, but I was able to find a few bright spots as well, which will come out. But let's just start out with kind of the epidemiology. Currently in the world, an international perspective, there's 33 million cases. All continents and countries have been affected. And the U.S. accounts for more than 20% of those world cases. Sadly, in the world, we reached a milestone of 1 million deaths earlier this week. In the United States, we reached a milestone of more than 7 million cases and 200,000 deaths. Currently in the United States, there's 45,000 cases per day. In April, what, kind of what we thought was going to be the peak, there was about 32,000 cases a day. May and June, in the spring, things got better. I think we were thinking maybe we were over it. But then come, come July, uh, things got worse. And there was increasing numbers of cases in the end of July and August, up to 70,000 cases a day and more than 1,000 deaths weekly. Now, COVID is the third leading cause of death behind cancer and heart disease. And more people are currently dying of COVID than lung disease, accidents, or Alzheimer's. Residents in the United States are more than eight times as likely to die of COVID than residents of Europe. Turning a little bit closer to home in Oregon and Washington, um, Oregon said 33,000 cases and Washington 90,000 cases. But we're lucky overall. Oregon ranks number 41 in cases per capita, ranked in the United States, United States and Washington 39. Uh, a little bit of concern in the future, Oregon had its peak cases for the entire COVID epidemic last Friday uh, with 457 cases. We're seeing some evolving patterns, a higher intensity of outbreaks in rural greater than urban areas. Mallard County's heavily affected, Umatilla and Boardman. Younger people we know are more likely to get the virus, but less likely to get sick from it, hospitalized or die. Last week at University of Oregon, there were 22 cases. Go, go Ducks and OSU, 13 cases, go Beavers. We know the outbreaks are tied to certain work environments. This is pretty predictable. We've seen this around the country. These are environments where social distance is challenging, corrections facilities, food processing facilities, warehouses, senior living facilities, and long-term care facilities. One thing that's been consistent through the outbreak is the marked disparities based on race and ethnicity. We see similar patterns in the United States and Oregon and Washington. For instance, in Oregon, white and Asian individuals have about four cases per thousand. Pacific Islanders and multiracial individuals, six cases per thousand. Black individuals, 14 cases per thousand, and Hispanic and Latino ethnicity, 23 per thousand. Hospital rates around 8%, so you can just see that's a lot of people getting sick and not fairly distributed. That's kind of a, a summary, Keith, of what's going on with the epidemiology. We're in a phase where we're concerned about what's going to happen in October, um, but also we may see things uh, stabilize as well. Yeah, it's, it's staggering to hear that something we weren't really even aware of at this point a year ago is now the third leading cause of death uh, in America and um, and just the disparity that it has across our population. Um, turning to testing, a lot of news and a lot of coverage on, on testing. Uh, can you give us an update and let us know kind of where members can get tested safely and conveniently? Yeah, so we're really running a successful PCR-based testing program. The PCR is the nasal swab uh, that detects virus particles. Uh, we're doing this in our urgency care facilities. Uh, we're doing this in our clinics. Um, if positive, uh, it generates kind of an immediate clinical follow-up. Um, uh, the testing is available uh, to people who have, all people who have symptoms related to COVID. Uh, it's also available to people who have contacts, family members or work contacts uh, who've had COVID. Uh, it's also available from asymptomatic people uh, with public health requests, and even for college students and those needed to travel. Um, we test prior to certain kinds of surgeries that we do uh, and certain kind of procedures. So we know early testing is important after exposures, and we do want to catch everybody uh, if they've had an exposure. We know if we can catch people in those first few days before they have symptoms, they'll be much less likely uh, to infect other people. Um, uh, so at current time, we have adequate capacity to meet the needs of our members, uh, the supply chain related to COVID testing. It's all the different things that need to be done, the swabs, uh, the reagents, uh, the um, tubes the reagents go in, 
all that stuff. Uh, it's a pretty tenuous supply chain and we have multiple systems online right now uh, to um, uh, meet uh, meet the needs. There was about six weeks ago, there was a, a couple of weeks where some of the reagents didn't come through and we actually had to be a little bit nervous about testing and we thought we were maybe difficult with capacity, uh, but that's better now. Finally, we are able to provide this data to employer groups um, that are large employer groups about their group's experience uh, with COVID, uh, with hospitalizations, with positive versus negative test results. Um, that's the main test that we're using. There's also an antibody test that is available uh, when a member requests it, but um, there's some liabilities with that test. I think we'll talk about that a little bit later. Go on to the uh, next slide, I think. Um, we've done to date almost a million tests uh, within Kaiser Permanente. Um, and the current total positive rates, almost 10%. Um, that's a pretty high rate. And then we're not, we're not seeing numbers that high. Initially, at the beginning of the outbreak, only people who really were quite sure had COVID uh, were testing. In the Northwest region, we've done more than 117,000 tests. And we're doing that with a turnaround time much quicker than the community. We're currently able to uh, turn a test result around from the time when someone comes in, uh, gets that swab done, maybe through a drive-through program or the urgency care. And really within 16 hours, we're able to get that test result back to somebody on uh, electronically on kp.org. If it's positive, they get a sort of immediate uh, clinical follow-up to make sure that they're educated about what that means, how to protect their family members, what kind of symptoms uh, to follow up with. You can see the national average there is four days. And we are stories about uh, people waiting 10 days and 14 days uh, for their COVID test result. Really, at that point, it's... Um, really not adding any useful information. In the last two weeks at Kaiser Permanente Northwest, we've had 4% positive rate. 6.4% uh, of people who were symptomatic were positive, uh, and 1.2% of people who were asymptomatic uh, were positive. So it's out there, um, but really the majority of people, even who have symptoms, really have something else going on, and it's not COVID. Next question, Keith. Well, um, I guess if you could just uh, walk through kind of what are the what are these steps that we're taking to to keep us safe? A um, number of people are concerned with um, with staying safe during COVID, and what are the steps that we're taking um, to keep our patients and our members safe? Yeah, so um, lots. Really, we've seen market changes in care delivery. Some of the things that we were already doing, we're able to leverage uh, in the context of COVID to keep people safe. And one of those is our telehealth. And really, that's a different than it, the way we're doing telehealth is really different than the rest of the industry. Uh, and telehealth at Kaiser Permanente is really connected with somebody's uh, overall care. It can be a primary care telehealth visit, urgency telehealth, urgency care telehealth visit, um, or specialty care telehealth visit. And there's telehealth going on in all those uh, different um, uh, dimensions. Telehealth can look like a video visit, uh, which is something that's really increased markedly. I think people are getting more and more comfortable uh, with video visits, both patients and physicians. Uh, and I know my patients are commenting, even ones that were skeptical commenting, really how useful the um, video visit is. Uh, finding we're doing mental health by video visits, it's really great to make that eye contact. Telehealth can also look like email. It can also look like phone appointments. Um, we and before COVID, we initiated an e-visit program, which is an algorithmic primary care visit for a whole list of about 60 different common primary care conditions, um, whether it's rash, headaches, UTI symptoms, allergy symptoms, cough and colds. Uh, and uh, a member kind of goes through that algorithm, answers the questions, uh, and then when they get to the end of it, uh, a Kaiser physician follows, Kaiser Permanente physician follows up with them uh, within an hour or so to make sure that the algorithm worked, uh, follow up with any prescriptions, uh, other advice, uh, or follow up care. That was really quickly configured for COVID and has been a very successful way to help people sort through their symptoms, determine who needs to be testing, or whether care is necessary. From the e-visit, somebody could be resolved, situation just with home care advice, or they could follow, need an office visit appointment, a follow-up appointment, or a referral to the emergency room. All the things you would get at a regular uh, phone visit or office visit. Um, 
other things that we were able to leverage was were our mail order pharmacy, which we were already market leading. We were able to expand that even further uh, during COVID. Uh, and that has, has worked out well with really rapid uh, turnover of mail order pharmacy time. Um, uh, other telehealth could look like an emotional wellness online support resources, uh, which are apps, which would be either the Calm app uh, is one of them. Uh, uh, and then there's other, other ones as well to help support emotional wellness. Um, there is also a telehealth online screening tool to help kind of sort out COVID symptoms and who needs testing. So when someone comes to the office, they really do see a different environment. It's much, there's always uh, a greeter who makes sure that they're wearing a mask or provides a mask if someone's not wearing one, checks the temperature, makes sure that somebody uh, uh, doesn't have a fever. Um, well, then if the waiting rooms are empty, the high level of sanitation going on in the facility, visitors are limited, um, and then we're offering, off, offering curbside pickup uh, for uh, pharmacy as well. So it's a whole different feeling right now. It's quieter, it's calmer, lots of room in the waiting uh, area and lots of parking as well. So um, one of the questions that came in and I just remind you to take advantage of the Q&A option is what about uh, for uh, members who are patients who have tested positive about going back in and when do they get retested? Do they get retested before they go back to work or what's kind of the yeah. protocol and recommendations there? That's one of the most common questions that we're getting from employer groups right now is how to deal with uh, returning people to work uh, after a diagnosis of COVID. So the recommendations are pretty clear on that, that after somebody has symptomatic COVID, they need to stay off work for 10 days and have no fever for 24 hours. And at that point, they can return to work. At that point, they're not infectious. Although intuitively you'd say, well, let's do a test to make sure somebody's not infectious. It turns out that that test is pretty unreliable. The test measures virus particles and people frequently can have for weeks particles in their, in their nose or so where the test is done, uh, which would then be a false positive test. So it's considered to be very uncommon to have somebody, if not impossible for somebody to be infectious following 10 days uh, of isolation after a diagnosis. Um, in fact, the recommendation from the CDC is not to retest somebody for 90 days after a COVID diagnosis. But that employee could feel, even if they're asymptomatic, maybe not feel well for another 21 days. I think I heard you say earlier. Is that right? Yeah, that's I, that was news to me. That was in the CDC website as I was preparing for this, that the average, or the Oregon Health Authority website, excuse me, the average number of days Oregonians report being ill after COVID diagnosis for people who have symptoms is 21 days and 26 or longer uh, for people who have been in the hospital. So that's just a long time. So maybe people may be yeah. well beyond that 10 days of necessary being off work um, and still not feeling well, not able to go back to work because they can't meet their job demands. Okay, uh, let's switch to the topic of vaccinations. There's multiple vaccinations that are uh, in development. Can you share uh, any news on the treatment for COVID-19 and when we might, or when a vaccine might be available? Well, that's the, the, the billion dollar question is when a vaccine is going to be available. And I wish I had an answer for that, but it is really good, good news in that part. The CDC thinks that, that vaccines hopefully will be available by second or third quarter in the 20, in 2021. And several of vaccine manufacturers say they can produce up to a billion vaccines per year, but it's not easy work and there's still challenges there. And historically, up to 90% of vaccines uh, that have been tested have failed. Luckily, we have more than 200 vaccine candidates. One bit of concerning news, though, is that the Pew Research Foundation found that the number of U.S. adults who state they will accept a COVID-19 vac vac COVID vaccine reduced from 72% in May to 50% in September. So three vaccines to know about. One is the Bonderna vaccine. This was initially tested at Kaiser Permanente Washington. It's an mRNA vaccine, uh, and it's currently in phase three tests. mRNA, this is the first use of mRNA vaccines, or the, uh, which is a newer technology for vaccines. mRNA actually is, a, is just a chemical molecule of RNA that is in the vaccine. It doesn't need egg or animals to be developed. So it really can be synthesized in a chemistry laboratory um, from, from RNA pieces. Uh, and then those get into the uh, cells and the cell starts creating uh, the protective proteins against the spike protein. Second, uh, second vaccine to know about is the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine. That's also mRNA. And that's 
current uh, a phase three trial at the Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Research uh, is ongoing. I think they're no longer recruiting uh, local Northwest um, patients for that, uh, but the trial is going on around the world. It'll be tested on 44,000 people. Uh, and then um, just mentioning CHR, our research center, they are, although the Pfizer, local Pfizer trial is concluding, uh, they're planning or expecting to land contracts uh, and grants to participate in two additional trials as part of the NIH Operation Warp Speed. And the third vaccine to know about is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and that's the one that hit the news recently because there was a pause for about a week after a side effect developed in one participant. Um, it's, it's restarted uh, in Europe, uh, but not in the United States. And that, that's not an mRNA virus. That's an adenovirus-based uh, vaccine. Turning to treatments, um, this is a, another sort of bright spot. I think we are getting better for people that do have COVID and require the hosp hospital care. I think that's a place where we're getting better. So uh, dexamethasone, which is a, a steroid that's inexpensive, has been shown to be effective. So that's now standard of care uh, at Kaiser Permanente as part of our COVID treatment protocol. The second new part of standard of care is remdesivir, uh, which we were involved in the randomized control trial uh, that showed that it was effective at decreasing severe COVID disease. Currently at our hospitals, uh, there is a uh, randomized control trial, which is the highest quality trial going on that's combining remdesivir for everybody uh, with other immune modulators, one of those being interferon, which is a drug that's used to treat MS, and another medication, baricitinib, uh, which is a rheumatoid arthritis drug. Convalescent serum is something that's being talked about. There's been studies showing uh, modest effectiveness. Uh, and then um, there are some other treatments that are being uh, used selectively as well. Okay. So lots, great, uh, lots yeah, to watch. One reason that COVID, deaths from COVID is going down is due to the better hospital care. We are getting better at it. Kaiser Permanente, I know our physicians feel fortunate that it's not, they have a great deal of expertise and they're able to share ideas, best practices with their intensive care and pulmonology colleagues uh, around the country. I know we were, had one of the first experiences with severe COVID uh, based on their experience in the Westside Hospital. Uh, in with really the first diagnosis of COVID in the Northwest region and really have learned a lot since that time on how to most effectively manage COVID uh, and prevent complications. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Bachman. We'll get back to you with uh, questions. Appreciate the, uh, the update on, on COVID-19, a lot taking place there. Uh, Dr. Deconis, want to transition to you now and uh, Anything that you would add as we've had this conversation around the latest on, on COVID um, and vaccines from your perspective? Yeah, hi, hi, thanks, Keith. Can you hear me okay? Coming through loud and clear. Great, um, so, yeah, so thank you uh, everybody for joining us for this uh, speaker series. And uh, I, I know that uh, you are all busy uh, individuals. So uh, I really appreciate and will appreciate the conversation, particularly your feedback and input on, on what you would like to continue to engage us with and talk about. Uh, just to follow up on that slide about, about the treatment, you know, at the beginning, we did not know much about uh, this virus and COVID-19, the syndrome that it causes. So if you were to get acutely ill today, for example, with COVID-19, you would have 30 to 50% uh, less risk of dying if you are one of those people who were so severely Ill, Ill that you needed to be hospitalized or be in the ICU just because of all the, the, the treatments that and, and the treatment protocols that we have been putting together and continuing to enhance and iterate as we learn more about this virus and the syndrome it causes. Thank you. So it's, um, it's great to see the progress we've been making and the greater life expectancy. And that's, that's so critical, you know, that we learn as quickly as we can. Um, let's again, turn to the, to the flu season. So many of the health concerns in 20 affect our lungs. So we have COVID-19, um, there's smoke from the fires, and there's a flu season that's coming. So how are these related? 
um, in their impact to us and their symptoms, and then how are they different? Yeah, if we, if we could go to the next slide. I'm a visual learner, so as, as ah. somebody's talking to me, it's good to have something to look at. And so, um, you know, who knew not only would we be dealing with a pandemic, but along the West Coast and certainly here in Oregon, uh, yet another crisis with the historic, historic wildfires. So this table hopefully summarizes uh, and gives you an overview of some of the differences. And if Oops, it appears, I think we've if you look at just you the lose boxes our... don't exist or where they exist, if you look at influenza and COVID, Oops, so oh, can you hear me you now? Can... Can you... Well, yeah, we me? lost you for a little bit there. We, okay. we can hear you now. We lost you for a little bit for the bottom to check the boxes. Yeah. So if you look at the comparison between influenza and COVID-19, you know, the, the GI symptoms uh, predominate in the COVID-19 more compared to influenza. And just the loss of taste or smell, we typically don't see that in influenza, whereas in some uh, reported cases of COVID-19 that that is apparent, right? Uh, you've heard that in, in the media. And then, and then just about the smoke for a little bit. So um, we know that wildfires happen year over year, and part of this is um, because of, of climate change. Now, having said that, we also know that the particulate matter, that, that bad air that is produced from these wildfires, upwards up to 400,000 premature deaths are attributed year over year just to wildfires because of this particulate matter that's in that uh, air. And all of us who have you know, lived through the days of when we've looked at, at the air quality of hazardous or very unhealthy air, we have some really real-time acute impact to that, particularly in the individuals with chronic lung illness. So COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, people with emphysema, people with asthma, and, and yes, chronic heart disease, because a lot of those patients, people have also these concomitant uh, lung illness issues. And so there were acute and there are acute um, impact from these days of, of bad air and smoke. And then really only time will tell what the long-term impact of the hazards of you know, uh, breathing that foul air for days, particularly for young children and infants where their lungs are still developing. So. Um, remains to be seen what happens there. Now this slide uh, talks about the fatalities of these conditions, COVID-19 and influenza. And as Dr. Bachman already reported, unfortunately we've surpassed the 200,000 deaths in this country alone and globally a million and probably more so because uh, that's an underestimate given that certain countries report deaths differently. And when you think about the fact that United States, as, as you heard in other places, is 4% of the population, but we account for 20% of those deaths. And so we have many opportunities uh, as, as a country, as communities to absolutely continue to work on masking, physically distancing, frequent hand washing. If you look at the flu fatalities, uh, similarly, you know, year over year, upwards of 30, 60, thousand in the last three flu seasons deaths and that's just in the United States and what's more what this graph doesn't show is the millions of people who get sick and seek care so so 12 to 16 million people in the last you know three flu seasons have sought care for flu, flu related symptoms and of that nearly half a million requiring hospitalization so a lot of toll on human suffering. And for, for the businesses, for us businesses, and, and some of us are essential workers and, and essential businesses, um, when you think about months lost uh, in just human suffering, but also in productivity of the workforce. So there are ways, you know, these are preventable. Many of these are preventable. And maybe in the next slide, uh, um, you can just look at 
it's not that they look blue or red, but this is just to distinguish um, the two in terms of infectiousness, transmission, as you see there. And the vaccines that we talked about it really target those uh, proteins on the RNA virus. Well, let's, uh, we can move then to the, uh, the benefits of the flu vaccine. I mean, I think there's one is to talk about what, uh, what are the benefits of the vaccine? Is it, is it really worth it? And then I think the other is there's concerns, I think, often with patients this day and age thinking, is, is the, the risk of visiting a medical facility worth it to get a flu shot given that we have COVID? So I think it will just a discussion around the benefits of the flu shot itself and then that risk around um, going to medical facilities in some way to get uh, to get a flu shot. Yeah, so so pandemic or not, it's always, always a good idea to get your flu shot. And, and let's just clear the urban myth just right now. You cannot get the flu from the flu shot. The flu shot is composed of inactive uh, parts of the virus, so you cannot get the flu from the flu vaccine. Now, having said that, can you have some symptoms after getting the flu shot? I get them. I get the achy arm, maybe sometimes malaise where I feel like, you know, oh, I feel round down. But, you know, every year when I get it, I, I pre-medicate or I, maybe this is TMI, but um, I medicate with ibuprofen just anticipating that I might get those achiness and, and things like that. And so I got my flu shot yesterday, for example, and uh, ibuprofen within the hour of getting it and uh, had to take another dose of ibuprofen this morning and, and I'm fine. And so, so urban myth aside, uh, now we have this pandemic on top of it, right? So, so I would say let's protect ourselves and remove, remove the confounding factor of if and when you do develop symptoms, is this COVID, is this flu, what do I have? I mean, you just saw the table about the intersection and uh, about the flu symptoms as well as COVID-19 symptoms, a lot of overlap. So why torture yourself with this confounding thing of, is this COVID-19, is this flu? The other thing is, um, again, as you saw the burden, the burden of illness, not just on, on humans, on, on us people, but also as businesses, you are business owners, you are business leaders, Think about the burden of either getting COVID or, or the flu or at the same time, right? So why wouldn't we, we have this vaccine? We're talking about this, this billion dollar question of when are we gonna get COVID-19 vaccine and really we're gonna forego getting the flu vaccine that's right in front of us and right is available to us now. So it, it really doesn't make sense on many fronts. And, and lastly, it's a plea. It's a plea from healthcare systems, just like we talked about at the beginning of the pandemic surge. Let's flatten the curve. Let's not overwhelm the health systems. So imagine a flu season where if it remains like it normally does in other seasons where a vast majority of people don't get vaccinated, we will be overrun with testing for COVID-19, the flu, PPE, hospital beds, et cetera. So I am not overstating the risk when I say that there is, there is a risk of overwhelming the healthcare system if you don't get the flu and it's a horrible flu season. Yeah, it's important to point out that we don't wanna overwhelm the flu because we could have another COVID surge and what we don't want then is a surge of just regular flu that is is highly, um, highly preventable. So that, that's, that's, a, that's an important point. Right. And it is safe. Uh, so, so here are the list. You asked me earlier uh, about the safety of getting the flu vaccine for those who are concerned about coming to a facility. So more than other times, we've stood up more drive-through clinics this flu season and uh, also other ways that you can get the flu shot without being uh, around many, many people. We're still following the, the CDC, I mean, the guidelines about physical distancing and the like. And so, so we are providing more options uh, in our facilities, particularly as the facilities are also using different protocols in terms of maintaining 
how many people in there, as well as the how frequently we disinfect and sanitize. Yeah, great to see. I happened to be at a, a clinic last Wednesday, and a number of people coming in to get the flu shots and having it uh, segregated so it was safe and it was accessible. Uh, and then looking at you know other ways that we can make it even safer, whether that's drive-through, easy, convenient uh, flu clinic. So I'd say you know to our employers, continue to watch for what will be continuing to evolve to make the flu vaccines as easy, safe, and convenient uh, to get as as we possibly can. Um, before we go forward, though, have there been predictions for the severity of the flu season this year? Dr. Deconis, have you seen that? How reliable is that or what are you hearing? So uh, I, I just had this conversation with the chief of our infectious diseases department yesterday, Dr. Spindel, and, and his answer to that is uh, how I can predict or how I can tell how severe the flu season is, is uh, because it's past. There is There are no predictors, there's no markers of how the flu season will be. You know, we can look at the Southern hemisphere and say, oh, it went this way. But uh, honestly, year over year, uh, there is no way of predicting how severe the flu season will be. And there has been one case okay. in Oregon documented so far. Yeah. All right, we have, we've had our first case of the flu. For... Yep. Interesting. So let's, just, maybe we'll go to the to the next slide. Yeah, so this is How just a hope, hopefully it's in, ingrained on us uh, after this talk today. Maybe, you know, let's aim for the triple aim at the bottom or quadruple aim if you add uh, frequent hand washing. It's continue the physical distancing, the masking, and the flu vaccine. Uh, the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts when you put it all together for protecting yourselves as well as, as the community and your family. So um, sometimes there's concern. We talked about this a little bit beforehand of uh, parents bringing their children in for flu shots. Um, but it's not, as I understand, it's not just about those children getting the flu, but they can spread and carry it to others. But, and there's a, you know, there is a significant portion of the population in the Northwest that is not in favor of vaccines. So maybe just a little bit on that and from a clinician's point of view. Yeah, I mean, hopefully the, the measles um, outbreak that happened here in the Northwest and in Washington will be a lesson on, you know, here's a very preventable illness. Um, we have a vaccine available. Why, why wouldn't be? It's um, there. All the scientific data is available about the safety of these vaccines, and so I would just urge us, as we are talking about COVID nineteen, uh, let's use science um, as our guide and evidence as our guide, and um, particularly as the knowledge about uh, COVID nineteen and, and flu vaccine continue to expand. Um, let's use science to, to make those choices. Okay. So uh, take a, a little bit of a, a, a turn here uh, on similar themes around the pandemic, but, you know, I think, you know, you, Dr. Deconis, uh, me, um, Dr. Bachman, Jennifer, those on this webinar are all facing unique high levels of sustained stress since March. I mean, it's just been a world that we have not been um, used to. We've had to find new ways to balance remote working. Some are having to do homeschooling, not by choice, but just that's where the kids are safe. Um, we have to do social distancing, so we're often not as connected to our support structures. And all of this amid political turmoil, there's social unrest. Um, it's, a, it's a unique year to say, uh, to state the obvious. But as a care provider, kind of what perspective and advice can you add for those who are experiencing that, particularly around those who are providing care? Because we might, we're taking care of often our loved ones. And so what's your perspective and advice there? Yeah, so some sobering numbers, maybe if we go to the next slides. Um, 
So I'm just going to let our viewers just marinate in, in some of these numbers because because those situations that you describe, you know, we're, we're all living it. It's impacting not, not only the population, but also the caregivers, the population of caregivers. Um, so in, in addition, you know, addiction is up. Uh, alcohol use disorder is on the rise over 240% increase online sales of alcohol. Social media is also normalizing alcohol use as a coping mechanism. Uh, there are posts out there and cartoons about when people start drinking in the day. And so, so it's, all in, in, um, it, it's all on us to, to figure this out and, and really lean on one another for, for support uh, more than ever. And you know some of the uh, digital therapeutics available there. So uh, on KP app, for example, your know, access to my strength or calm. We've had a lot of favorable feedback from our members and patients about just access to that for free, as opposed to paying a subscription. Also our clinicians uh, are using it and especially our primary care docs who are recommending it to their patients their own experience in using it, their own family's experience in using it has been a helpful um, way to experience it so that when they're engaging with patients or our members, they know, you know, uh, really what the experience is like. I, I know my son likes Calm, uh, the app Calm that he has access to. Uh, and, and so it's the digital therapeutics is just the basic thing that the people can access. And certainly we have uh, moved a lot of our uh, behavioral health consultants uh, touch points to, to video and virtual, as well as our mental health therapists and our uh, psychiatrists. And really what the white paper, what the evidence shows about mental health help is that the sooner you intervene, the sooner the, the symptoms are shorter and the more you can prevent escalation of symptoms. And so access to behavioral health consultants in KP is, is now uh, widespread and we're looking to recruit more of them as that first front door of, of complementing the, the digital therapeutics with the apps in addition to primary care, in addition to then even before they need uh, help getting to the mental health therapist. So that's been very helpful to expand our capacity and and group visits, group visits both for addiction medicine therapy and group visits for mental health therapy. Oops, I think we may have lost uh, Amelda for a little bit. Just cut out. People who can well, I think um, with you in, in, in the... Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, we, we hear you now. Just okay. lost you there for probably 20 seconds. I'd say just to uh, to emphasize that point, uh, you know, um, what I'm seeing with with my employees, and I think hearing from others is just the pervasiveness of the stress and how that comes out. Is it you know it's illustrated here in terms of child care, caring for others, yeah. um, and then balancing so much, and then being disconnected um, from others is you know it's very timely in terms of how do we reinforce for our employees and for others the removing the stigma to ask for help, right? So that's right. been something we've really wanted to do for some time. And it's uh, so important here that they um, hear that from multiple channels, that it's the brave thing to do is to reach out and to ask for help and to seek um, seek some assistance as we confront uh, these new times and these new stresses, which you know, none of us have really been prepared for, for this magnitude or for this long. And it looks like it's going to continue. Um, certainly for the foreseeable uh, future. So thanks, uh, Dr. Deconis. I'll, I'll come back to you with some questions in, in just a little bit. I wanted to take a, a, a turn now and, and go to, to Jennifer. And I think it weaves in nice with what we were just talking about, Jennifer, which is you know, we see this as our employees and um, as they're having to provide care, take care of themselves, take care of their family, the additional stress and we're thinking part of our mission is to help employers have a productive, engaged workforce. And in doing that, that is part of their, their health care. Um, part of the way that we've addressed that is, uh, is through our, our playbook. And um, so I'm sure as many have seen this before, but could you share any updates for the COVID-19 workforce health playbook 
a long name for trying to make resources available, Jennifer? Yes, absolutely. So thank you, Keith. The playbook provides a framework, curated resources, and ideas as we all consider, uh, that we can all consider as we evolve to what we're considering the next normal. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's massive. It currently runs about 150 pages, but it is divided into chapters to help you drill down into the information that's most relevant to you easily. The chapters run the gamut. They are, cover HR policies, safety plans, plans and returns to work screenings, mental health and emotional well-being, the social drivers of health, as well as monitoring regulatory and legal changes and more. And as you mentioned, we're continuing to update the playbook as the science evolves and as we receive feedback from our partners about what would be most useful to them. So the most recent iteration includes updates on sanitation and masking, guidance around contact tracing and how to support that in the workforce, and employee resources. I'd note that we also have a playbook that's focused on return to school, which I know is heavy on everybody's minds. So we'll send out the link to the playbook with the survey, but you can also um, contact your account manager to get the most updated versions. Now, We've been talking about support for employees, and that's a huge topic, and we mentioned that many workers are taking on additional caregiving responsibilities. In 2007, the EEOC provided some best practice guidance that's incredibly, incredibly relevant in today's environment. And the baseline is making sure that your managers and leaders are really familiar with the laws protecting workers that have caregiving responsibilities, and that they understand the type of uh, behavior that may constitute unlawful discrimination. So when you're uh, making an effective policy, it's helpful to define relevant terms like caregiver and caregiving responsibilities, and to include a definition of family that extends to any individual for whom the employee has primary caretaking responsibilities. So really updating that definition for the world we live in today. It can be help to, helpful to describe common stereotypes or biases that result in unlawful conduct, such as assuming that maybe male workers do not or should not have significant caregiving responsibilities. I think the last study I saw is about 45% of male coworkers do have significant caregiving responsibilities now. And then on the flip side, that uh, females would prefer or should prefer to spend time with families versus work. So um, you really want to make sure people understand what that looks like and what to avoid. So I'd say in addition to legal protections, we know that supportive workplace policies increase productivity, reduce absenteeism, and appear to positively impact the bottom line. Now, not all employers can provide flexible work scheduling, but this can be life-changing for those who need the additional flexibility to arrange for medical appointments, provide care for a parent, or these days simply attend a fourth grade math class to get somebody through. Um, for those less flexible roles, consider offering caregiver benefits. For example, our Kaiser Permanente clinical workers now have access to temporary child care grants, and there's a call resource uh, support to help them with needs during the pandemic, like hotel support, child care, mental health concerns, and social needs. Finally, I'd say when an employee does need to take a leave of absence for their caregiving responsibilities, it's recommended that they have there's a dedicated resource to really help them navigate the policy and that policies are fair and available to all impacted workers. Now, you'd mentioned about and I think everybody knows that we've all experienced increased emotional demands over the last month, so or months, as it's the case may be. So strong mental health support is critical. In addition to providing benefits to support access both to mental health and substance abuse clinical care, if you have EAP conducting a campaign to raise awareness about EAP services and to reduce the stigma associated with using those services can be very helpful. 
And we talked a little bit about self-care and how that's become an important addition to supporting emotional wellness. I'd recommend that you reach out to your partners to determine what's already available. Um, You know, Kaiser Permanente has a range of self-care resources open to everyone, community members, members, and employees that help build resilience, develop coping skills, sleep better, manage stress, uh, you name it, just to help feel more mentally and emotionally refreshed. Uh, Dr. DeConis mentioned that our members also have access to My Strength and the Calm apps to help support mental health and to ClassPass, which helps support physical health. Now, educating your employees about the benefits you offer not only help them manage their care more effectively, but it can also increase the perceived value of the benefits that employers pay so much to provide their employees. Uh, Next, I'd say I mentioned EAP, but there are also alternatives to help provide support, such as national nonprofit resources, community organizations, or other healthcare organizations. Like I mentioned, Kaiser Permanente has many publicly available resources, so you don't have to create everything from scratch. You can really lean on partners far and wide to help you um, provide those resources to employees. And then finally, we've talked about the use of telehealth, and it really has impacted all healthcare providers. So at Kaiser Permanente, you know, you can access primary and specialty care. You can get routine care, your mental health um, therapy treatments, you name it, you're able to get it with telehealth. And no matter how you connect or who you connect with, the care providers have access to the health histories, can make appointments for you, and can, will update the records in support of the next visit. Now, to that end, employers can help support their employees by making sure their policies are up to date. So, for instance, most employers allow an employee to take time off to go to an in-person medical visit. But do you allow your employees to simply step away from work for a much less disruptive telehealth visit? And if you do, do they have a private space they can conduct these visits? So overall, it's really about looking hard at the world we live in and then thinking of ways, both big and small, that we can make it possible for employees to stay as healthy and as productive as possible, no matter what 2020 continues to throw our way. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. So uh, just um, you oversee a number of employees and part of a larger organization that uh, works with employees, many. So in your management of employees during 2020, uh, what have you found to be important for sustaining both you and your team during these challenging times? Yeah, uh, first of all, shout out because I have such awesome employees that, you know, having them there does help sustain me. And really, really importantly, and this is hard to do, is to try to work out time Um, carve out time to connect. So making sure that it's not always business and it's not always just a, you know, march through the day, one meeting after another, but that you, um, you know, ask how somebody's doing. You can connect in different ways, whether it's, you know, text and sharing, oh, what did you do this weekend? It's, it's really those small things that you would naturally do during the course of a day when you're face to face. But then I would say also as important is to recognize that, you know, people are fatigued. They're fatigued by this video kind of um, environment. They're fatigued by constant meetings. And we're seeing it bleed into before work, after work, all over the place. So it's really trying to find that balance of connecting regularly, but then giving people some space and and realizing exactly what we've been talking about. Their worlds don't look the same as they did before, and um, it's hard to deprioritize things, but if there are areas to do so, I think now's the time. Yeah, I think that's a good point, is building in that water cooler time, for lack of a better term, so you didn't have those hallway, you're not having those hallway conversations unless you're more intentional about it now. I know we've seen our calendar fill up with meetings and meetings and the days kind of extend because why not? You're at home. Um, You can work as well. But then being intentional about making sure there's connections um, that really power people and keep them uh, committed to the work that they're doing and the company they're doing it with. So, yeah, uh, thank you. 
So we do have uh, several uh, questions here. So I think I'll uh, go back actually and start out with uh, Dr. DeConis. So um, what innovations in care delivery have you, uh, have been kind of been revealed or highlighted during COVID-19 that you think will then be applied going forward? So there's some learnings that take place with COVID-19 and what's, what are some of the, maybe the positive aspects of that that are gonna change the way we provide care not just for COVID patients, but for all the populations going forward. Yeah, uh, so, so something quick might be the uh, dermatology consultations. So uh, pre-pandemic, we were already working out workflows about um, how do we do video visits using pictures, you know, as the iPhone and other devices get better and better uh, cameras on them. How might we uh, improve the accessibility to dermatology? So, so pre-pandemic, we had a workflow where uh, you would see your primary care doc or somebody in primary care, and you might have a, a, a worrisome thing of concern. And in the moment, our primary care docs with you can take a picture, put it on the electronic health record, have it reviewed by dermatologists. But really, as, as with the shelter in place, where we are at now is a, uh, a patient can take a picture, it, it gets sent uh, to a, a pool. And from that, there's a review and it goes directly to the dermatologist. So, so it, it's made it uh, much more seamless and, and certainly quicker to, to get that consultation with, with dermatology. And, and you're, you said earlier in my introduction that Northwest Permanente is a B core. So one of the things that we work on is how do we how do we get to a climate friendly um, practice? And so these telehealth visits really, you know, we're, it's reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and our footprint, right? Because you're not driving around going from a clinic to your work or to home. It's really you can from where you're at, you can do the video visits. And so so that's one way to connect it. Uh, the other big thing is that uh, I'm not sure you're aware when you have a patient with complex cancer diagnosis. Uh, just to give you a real example, uh, we had a patient with uh, cancer of the, uh, what we thought was pancreas. And, and this is pre-pandemic. So this is what integrated care looks like. So pre-pandemic, cancer of the pancreas, uh, because we're all on electronic health, the same electronic health record, because we're one medical group, the, the oncologist sends the, the uh, note to the uh, cancer surgeon. Cancer surgeon looks at the images. Yeah, it could be this. Uh, it, it's suspicious for that. And they look at the uh, other scans. And then we discover in the patient it, it, that he also could have uh, an additional cancer of the, of the, bl of the bladder. So, so we can have all of these interactions behind the scenes as one medical group and then come back with a proposal to the patient on the treatment plan. But back in the day, those same um, cancer surgeons and oncologists would also be in a room and do what we call a tumor board, T-U-M-O-R, so tumor board, and discuss complex cases. So much like what I just described and what with the... Um, the video meeting, the Teams meetings, you know, everything is is in front of a, a video conference. So, so we now have tumor boards between our cancer surgeons, our oncologists, hematologists, uh, in a quicker fashion. Not, you know, people, doctors are not traveling to to go to the conference. And so again, it's it's uh, freeing up time to not only see patients uh, instead of driving around, but also getting to a quicker um, care conference about these complex patients. So those are just kind of a, yeah. I guess, the spectrum. Yeah, that's that, that's helpful to see uh, and to understand how it works on the dermatology and, and, and the tumor boards. Um, you know, one of the questions that that came in, it had to do with um, once we get a vaccination. So how do you see, and this would be for the physicians, you know, how do you see the community and KP dispensing and prioritizing? once we have a vaccine. So it's, imagine it won't be available for everyone right away. It's gonna take some production time. So, so what's your early thinking on how that might play out? Yeah, so there's already a playbook. So, you know, 
prior to the disbanding of the pandemic uh, team at the federal level, there have been 15 plus years of planning for a pandemic, believe it or not. So, so there's already a playbook of how do you distribute vaccines in a pandemic. Um, and, and so we would, we would use that playbook uh, and coordinate the work with the CDC, with the state authorities and public health. And exactly what you said is, is triage it. This is, we're very good at this in healthcare is, you know, what are the priority people that we need to vaccinate? like healthcare workers uh, and then the most vulnerable. So there's already a playbook um, and then a, a distribution plan for, for the country uh, if and when the vaccines um, come out. And as you can imagine, uh, the complexity of logistics and operations, it'll take months, it'll take months. So it's not just, you know, okay, we have a vaccine, it's ready to go and I'm vaccinated next day, right? So is, so, yeah. is, that, is that something that we work in in terms of the community, so with the other healthcare providers, because I would guess there's kind of a supply. So whether that, you know, all of a, all of those healthcare providers, Providence, Legacy, you yeah. know, um, and others. Yeah. How does no, that would happen? Be, yeah, there would be coordination of efforts, right? Because again, let's identify who are the tier one or who are the priority people we need to vaccinate, and then it's a matter of working the logistics between the healthcare systems and the systems that would be providing the vaccine. Uh, and what I'm really proud of uh, as an Oregonian is that in Oregon, our health systems are, um, we're very collaborative, we're very close knit. So at the very beginning of the surge, for example, you know, our CMOs, uh, you know, both from Northwest Permanente, from OHSU, uh, Providence, Legacy, uh, Peace Health, you know, it was really, uh, talking about sharing best practices and, and collaborating and and because um, this is you know uh, doctors we're used to it's all about teamwork right so so it's so nice mm -hmm. to see and and uh, as I know KP operates in other states it's not like that in other states I it's not like that in other states and so we are I am so proud that that our community is that um, purpose driven and and. Uh, community centric and person centric. Yeah, that's uh, that's good to hear. That the it, it, real strength of the community is that collaboration because that's when we need it the most. Exactly. So, uh, Dr. Bachman, you do go out and meet with a, a number of our groups, um, and well, now it might not be going out and meeting with them, but meeting with them virtually. I've got to change my vocabulary as well, so these are virtual meetings, but. Kind of what are a couple of the uh, common questions that you're fielding uh, from them that might be helpful for everyone calling in today? And then, and what's your advice on that? Just wanted to kind of pick your brain on what you're hearing and what the concerns are and that advice. Yeah, it's certainly the one thing that's really top of mind and hasn't gone away is how do we, how do I as an employer keep my employees safe? Um, when somebody thinks they may have COVID, when somebody has COVID, uh, when somebody has a health condition that may make getting COVID higher risk and how to work through those issues in a fair, compliant, uh, HR appropriate way. We do have support for that. We do have a series of templated letters that all the, all the physicians and the providers have access to. Uh, and then we're also able to field uh, calls from HR directors and employer, employer group leads uh, related to those. It is complicated. There are some great algorithms in the, in the playbook uh, that Jennifer mentioned that can be super helpful. Uh, there's great information on the CDC website, but there's also scenarios where you, we all look at it and puzzle through it and try to figure out what the best thing to do is. So I just want to normalize it. If it gets confusing and it's not clear what to do, that's a pretty normal response, and we're there to help support that. Um, that's probably the first question. And the second question is really about the emotional wellness and trying to rethink um, uh, worksite wellness and employer-based programs that help keep people healthy in the context of stress and the emotional demands of uh, dealing with COVID, uh, homeschooling, uh, and just an increasingly uh, fraught and anxiety-provoking provo anxiety environment that we're living in. I think we went through kind of the response to that, uh, whether it's checking in with people, uh, recognizing the social aspects of worth that need to be changed now, uh, and then uh, really good mentoring. Okay, thank you, yeah. 
Uh, Jennifer, uh, questions for you. So uh, will Kaiser Permanente provide on-site flu clinics? Well, sometimes we've done this for large employers. Yes, so we have and we will continue to, um, but what we really are advising is for employers to let em their employees know when the flu clinics for their health plan partners are. So as we talked about, you know, clinics are safe, but we have made a lot of changes to make sure that we reduce the number of people in them and we uh, prevent exposure. So part of this is that we have, we are standing up walk up and drive in uh, flu clinics and they start this Saturday and they run through the month. They've got, you know, convenient hours. So we have them in the different areas to cover all over through our service area. And so people can really come through with their families, get those uh, flu shots. They can also, if they have an appointment in a clinic, they can get it with the doctor. Um, but really those drive-through and walk-up clinics, I think are gonna be the most efficient and the least expensive way for employers to make sure that we raise the percentage of the population that has the flu vaccine this year. Yeah, I'd say it is a, a kind of a, classic example, if you will, about how we're trying to fulfill our mission of being mm -hmm. convenient, accessible, and affordable. Clearly, we can't do flu shots at, you know, four to 5,000 employers. And so what we can do is provide it through the facilities we have and encourage people to drive through there, which we'll have this year, or to stop in, make an appointment, or drop in and make those as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some cases where we will do that for the largest employers that have a concentration, but it's on a pretty very limited basis. Um, and we want to fully support that. So I, where should employers go to stay attuned and to get the latest? Uh, so they one is they know where to send their employees, their employees know where to go, and they understand the safety precautions that are being taken uh, to keep them healthy. Right. So um, you can always, your account manager will always have the uh, most recent information, but probably the easiest way is to go to kpa.org where we include information regarding how to get your flu shot, the flu clinics that are occurring, including those drive uh, drive through or walk up clinics, um, the hours. So you can really put it in by where you live or where you work however you're want, trying to locate your services, um, kp.org, and you'll be able to see the flu clinics. And those will be available okay. like 63 or 64 hours a week. It's pretty long hours, yeah. six days a week, eight, eight to seven during the week. So that's great, up, great, hoping for great convenience. Yeah, and, and yeah, nine and to I five on Saturdays as well. So, yeah, looking to make it even more convenient. And I think we will just continually assess that because we want a high vaccination rate as we possibly can. So, you know, balanced on the demand, um, but also we want to make this uh, more convenient than any time in the past uh, to get the, uh, the flu vaccine. Uh, Dr. Well, Bachman, I'll go to you. Oh, go ahead. Melna. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, in the you know, sometime soon and and uh, when we have the date uh, we we'll certainly share is that if you have the app uh, the the app will have the upgraded capability of of geosensing so that um, you will have based on where where you're located uh, just an, uh, a listing of the closest clinics uh, flu clinics where you can get your flu vaccine hours of operation and such. And Miguel did add into the Q&A, so the, the, the function there, the kp.org slash flu. So you can go there as well. So, so that's, that's available. Uh, Dr. Bachman wanted to turn to you. A couple of questions on uh, antibody testing. So how effective is the COVID antibody testing? And related to that, will KP be offering the 15-minute COVID test? So first, the COVID antibody test. So that test is available, and our members can request the antibody test at the lab. That's the good news. The bad news is we're not quite sure what it means. Um, we, when we see a positive antibody test, we think somebody either has had COVID uh, or they may have had another coronavirus. So it's not 100% specific for COVID. The other issue with it is we don't know how long 
people are immune from COVID. So even if they have an antibody, we don't know how long it's protective for. And we think it's probably three months, maybe more, uh, but we can't be certain about that yet. So at the current time, we really can't recommend making any changes in somebody's lifestyle, behaviors, work setting on the basis of a positive or negative COVID antibody test. So that's why we're not recommending it. Um, uh, it might be useful. I mean, the only places I've recommend had someone get it or could think about getting it is if somebody had a COVID-like syndrome in January, February, early March, before we had more testing available uh, to see if they may have had it. But it's really more just to fill in that piece of their life and to see why uh, why they felt so bad. It really doesn't have any clinical um, usefulness, and I, we definitely would not re recommend people going out without appropriate PPE if they're with the public or going out without a mask or things like that. Uh, so that's the antibody test. Uh, the antigen test is a, another test uh, that looks for viral particles, and it can be done with rapid turnaround time. Uh, but again, we're still not quite at the point where we're recommending that test, nor do we have the um, supply chain where they the technology in place yet to provide the antigen test. Um, so right now we really still think that the COVID PCR uh, RNA test is the best test to do, uh, which is done through a nasal swab. Okay. Uh, here's what I thought was interesting. Do you think the social distancing will help with minimizing or reducing the impact of the flu season this year? Just all the precautions we're taking around COVID. I do. Absolutely. I think the same thing as the hand, the hand washing, the social distancing, wearing masks to protect other people. All those things are going to be, I think, helpful at preventing flu. If you went back to that slide that we saw at the beginning, the differences sort of virologically between uh, flu and COVID, one difference is the super spreader events uh, that are noted uh, in COVID. So that those are thought more to relate to, to something that's going on where somebody's highly infectious uh, or there's some sort of other kind of spread. Um, and that's something that really, but, but everything else, um, there's really no differences in the way that it's spread. And those same things that we would do to prevent COVID should also help prevent influenza. But still get your flu shot. So, so. Yes. Uh, you know, it's the quadruple aim. So wash your hands, physically distance, mask, and get your flu shot. Take every precaution that you can. It's just um, the big, the big thing is, so okay. it's those indoor environments keep coming up in super spreading events. People packed into mm -hmm. a bar, people packed in, packed into an event where they're singing or uh, a religious event where people are singing uh, or, or another kind of event where people are shouting um, indoors, uh, in closed spaces. Um, so that's really something to, to focus in on. Um, a question came in, um, Dr. Deconis. What's the impact of poor air quality and smoke exposure to COVID risk? I would guess it just makes it worse, but go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, so so worst case scenario is, you know, I have asthma or emphysema and had to uh, endure the, the, the poor air quality. And then I was evacuated from my home. So then I'm in this congregate setting of big groups in, in a, a church or a, a high school gym or uh, some of these places where our um, unfortunate families and, and people had to be evacuated to. So, so you, you take up all those together and you know, the risks are, are added to. Because uh, as you heard me say, the particulate matter in poor air quality harms our lungs. Um, and then you have the uh, specter of COVID-19. And if you're in a, in a group in that super spreader uh, situation because you've been evacuated. So, so all of those things add up, uh, unfortunately, for poor for, for outcomes. Uh, another question came in. So if, uh, say, there's an employer that has employees that's not, they're not covered by KP or maybe they don't have coverage um, uh, any anywhere, so they're um, not meeting the work requirement. Is there a way that we or a place that we steer them in the community that they might be able to get a flu shot, or what kind of recommendation uh, might we have there? Yeah, I mean, there are, are you community, aware of any community resources? Yeah, so there there are community clinics, um, Keith, that we can uh, direct. Uh, 
non uh, AP members to how you know however they might end up in our facility or because um, they're community benefit partners that that we we help we, we give grants to uh, all throughout Oregon for example that that we can direct them to uh, for that so I think what we'll do is we'll I'll work with uh, with our team and we could put some of those resources and make those available uh, it's kind of a follow-up here so um, that people would have access to those community res resources. That's a good question. And certainly because we're trying to get to that third. Okay. Pharmacists, pharmacists in Oregon, I'm not sure about Washington, can do flu shots as well. Uh, another question came in. It's the Red Cross is doing antibody tests when people donate blood. Is there a way to get those results transferred into kp.org? Uh, the best... Uh, the best thing to do would just be to scan that and then send that in as part of an email. You can scan it, attach it, and then send it to us. It's not going to – people are asking if we want their COVID results as well from swab tests. Um, it's Again, the antibody test isn't going to change management, and a COVID swab test really doesn't tell us too much more than what was going on that day and the next few days in that individual's health. So there's not a whole lot of value in that, but I think if somebody does have a positive antibody test, it'd be nice to let their uh, physician know about that. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, antibody testing is uh, more regularly used in the pediatric population because there's a multi-inflammatory uh, organ syndrome where using that plus uh, COVID tests help to make the diagnosis. So in pediatrics, there is utility in that uh, in terms of this diagnosing this very rare syndrome. I would urge anyone who is interested in getting antibody testing is, is really to participate in research studies. Right now, the most useful for adults in terms of what to do with antibody testing is to participate in, in research studies. Red Cross is participating in, in one of those, for example. But as Dr. Bachman said, it, it helps. It doesn't help in any shape or form determining uh, how you adjust uh, PPE use or not, uh, you know, any of those things. So one nice thing in the, uh, port, at least in the Portland metro area, that Providence and OHSU and Adventist Legacy are all electronically interconnected with their labs. So somebody does have a positive COVID test in any of the systems, we have access to it. It actually triggers all the same alerts and prompts and next steps in care that they would get uh, if they had the test done uh, through Kaiser Permanente. Okay. Uh, any closing comments? If not, I'll, um, I'll wrap up. I just wanted to see if there are any additional comments you had. Wash your hands, wear a mask. Physically distance. All right. <laughs> get your flu yeah, shot. Right. <laughs> yeah. Get your flu shot. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, and um, thank you again, everyone, just, for joining. I mean, I, I really appreciate these series. If there are any comments or feedback about the content we cover, uh, any other future opportunities for other topics that we should be uh, talking with you as employers, as brokers, as businesses, uh, please, uh, you know, totally open and continue to learn together. Thank you. Yeah, I just, just to echo and to build on that, um, we see it as our uh, part of our mission is to make businesses successful by having a healthy, engaged, and productive workforce. And it's beyond, beyond just providing uh, health insurance, but it's connecting with providers, evidence-based medicine, and being a, a positive force within our community. And we take that very seriously. And this is one way that we can do that. So if there's other topic issues that you would like us to address, please send those in. We take those seriously and shape these to be as, uh, as productive as possible. Um, we, part of this series has been, we started out with a uh, speaker series on equity, inclusion, and diversity, and touched on that a little bit today in terms of the disproportionate effect that COVID has had uh, on uh, minority populations. And it's not only that, but how do we have a, a care delivery system that reflects the values, the, the colors, the shapes, the beliefs of our community. And that's something that we're working at. We have a long way to go, but it's at the core of what we want to do. And so we had a speaker series on that. And, um, this one, obviously, we just had on COVID vaccines and the flu. And then next will be on behavioral health, mental health, and addiction um, related to today, but also much broader than, than that. 
Um, if you go to the, the next slide, um, I'd encourage you, if you have a desire to learn more about Kaiser Permanente, one of the ways that you can do that is, is through an experienced KP, um, a VIP pass, and it is a, a, a tour, if you will, of our facilities, and we do this virtually. Um, but more important than the facilities, which are interesting in and of themselves, but also it's the interaction with the clinicians. So understand how they're practicing medicine and using evidence and also being uh, very uh, patient and customer centric. So I encourage you to do that. Contact your account manager and they can help to, to schedule that. It's a, a valuable opportunity. So in closing, again, I wanna thank you for your time, your engagement. Um, we will, for those we weren't able to answer questions, we will follow up with those. Um, and uh, I'd also say if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to your account manager. Uh, they can be very helpful in helping navigate and that's what they're there for. So uh, they're uh, willing, able to assist you. Uh, thank you again for your time um, and for your help in keeping a healthy Northwest. And we certainly appreciate that. And thanks again to, to Jennifer, Dr. Bachman, Dr. DeConis. I wish you all the very best today. Be well and thrive. Thank you.